This is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a youth ministry podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. This season, we are continuing our series on discipleship that forms Christ-like characteristics. In this episode, we talk about some of the things immigrant communities can teach us about perseverance and hope. But first, let's hear what young people had to say about perseverance and hope. So when was the last time you experienced uh, hope? Last time I experienced hope was when I had school back in my hometown in Jakarta. I was in high school over there. And I started praying that I hope that I would move back to America and continue my high school and continue college there too. Now I'm back in California and continuing high school. And this is my last year about to graduate too. What about perseverance? Perseverance means... I would say perseverance means like not giving up and like, I would say accomplishing something even though it isn't easy. Who helps you persevere? My mom and my friends. My uncle too. They they all help me. And how do they do that? When I feel like I'm not doing my best, I go up to my mom and I'll be like, hey, like, I'm a, I can't do this anymore. And she'll be like, echale ganas, tu puedes. Um, take a break. And then with my friends, they'll do the same thing. They'll tell me like, you did your best um, and there's really nothing to change. And my uncle, he'll just be there as the support. And and like I told him some some good things that were happening in my life. He's like, you did your best and it's actually paying you off right now. Hello everyone, this is Rosan Hernandez and I am Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Manager and Content Producer at the Fuller Youth Institute. So we have an incredible trio of guests today. They are representing New Generation 3 and New Generation 3 is a resource training and consulting organization that promotes intergenerational discipleship in Latina and multicultural communities. Our conversation partners today are Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Conde Frazier, Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Thomas Mendez, and Marcos Canales. And I want to say here that please go to our show notes. We have so much information that we can't tell you uh, in the shortness of an episode of our podcast, but we do want to make sure that you can see all the other things that they are doing and go to all the other links that they have given us that um, can be resources for you. So please go to our show notes to learn more about our guests today. So we're going to start with Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Conde Frazier. Um, Elizabeth is a madrina in the Latina theological community and has decades of experience studying Latino young people in churches. She is a practical theologian and an ordained pastor of the American Baptist churches. And Elizabeth C., welcome. It's a real gift to be able to be here today and to be a part of this conversation. Great. Right, thank you for being here. Um, so we're going to move on with another Elizabeth, <laughs> um, Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Thomas Mendez, who is originally from Mexico City, is a founder and executive director of NewGeneration3.org. Um, oh, she's also um, been a collaborator of FYI, and I have had the honor of doing research with Elizabeth and just learning so much from her wisdom. Welcome. Thank you, Rosalyn. It's great to be here with you. It's good to see you again. And uh, we really appreciate the invitation. It's time of conversation. Thank you for being here. And last but definitely not least, <laughs> we have Marcos Canales. Marcos is an immigrant from Costa Rica of Peruvian parents. So uh, Peruvian Costa Rican say we could say. <laughs> um, he has been pastoring amongst the Latina community of Los Angeles for two decades. And Marcos is a pastor of La Fuente Ministries, which is a bilingual, intercultural, and intergenerational congregation in Pasadena, California. And Marcos has also been a friend and a collaborator of FYI for quite a while. So we are so excited to welcome welcome you back in this uh, in this podcast. 
Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, depending on when you're watching it <laughs> or listening to it. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it is truly an honor to have you three here today. We're gonna go. In, we're gonna go into some research in a little bit. We're gonna talk about practical tips. Uh, we, we're gonna receive your great wisdom and insight. But first, I'm wondering if we can start with some stories. Um, speaking from your experience as ministry leaders and as researchers, and um, in the Latinx or immigrant contexts. Do you remember a time when a young person taught you something about hope or perseverance? I can kick us off with a story on hope. Uh, one of our, in our congregation, one of our rhythms um, is to repeat a, a liturgy. And we, the phrase always says, loving God, you who are always besides us, abundantly loving us, strengthen us to defend justice all around the world starting with our concrete actions in our everyday life. And then the congregation responds, ayúdanos a construir la paz. Help us to build peace, shalom, right? So probably after a year of having done this, Evelyn, an eighth grader, surprised me one time um, after the service and said, you know what, um, we've, been, we've been praying this for a while and um, I didn't know what that meant for me. And she said, I'm just a middle schooler. <laughs> but she said, the, the, but for the last three months, I enrolled in a um, program in my, my school's conflict resolution um, mediator program to be trained as a peer-to-peer -peer mediator in conflict resolution in middle school. And they, they teach middle schoolers how to navigate conflict. And uh, so I was very excited, right? <laughs> like, That's amazing. Like, what inspired you to do that? And with the Grinch, he said, well, you know, that peace prayer that we do every week, I took it seriously. I heard about what other adults were doing in their everyday life, in their jobs. So I wanted to do the same, but in my own way. <laughs> I wanted to be a peacemaker, right? And so to me, that gives me hope. So that would be my, my, my hope story that uh, Evelyn gives me hope. Mm, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I worked as a dean at a non-traditional uh, junior college. And one of the things, one of the courses that, that uh, the young people take is on uh, doing a speech. And this young man got up and made a speech about his life. It was short. And he talked about how he had lived Uh, all of his life from the time that he had been four years old in foster homes. And uh, what it meant to uh, not be with his parents, what it meant to um, not know the love that some of his other friends at school had known, but also what it meant to know that even though he wasn't going to have those particular things, that he still had people who were uh, taking care of him and who believed in him. That, he said, is what kept him going from day to day. And now he's uh, at college and he has uh, learned to live uh, independently. And he says, I look at my past and knowing that I learned these things along the way, I know that I can continue to move my life forward. And I realize that God has cared for me all these years. And I'm absolutely sure that God will continue to care for me in my life as I move forward. And so that was perseverance. Everyone was shocked because he was not in an environment where others hadn't also been in foster care at different points of their lives. He helped them to have a different to have a different take on their story as foster care uh, persons, and to understand that they too could move their lives forward. That's such a wonderful story. That, as you said, it changed others in immigrant communities. There's so much hope and perseverance that you know, the very idea of 
becoming an immigrant, of moving to another place, there's a lot of hope in that. And in that process, there's a lot of perseverance as well. When families reach their destination, there's a lot more perseverance and hope that goes into that hardworking people who are persevering maybe for the coming generations. Um, And so the immigrant communities are a place where hope and perseverance is part of everyday life. But this example of someone who grew up in the foster care system has just, is just another layer and another um, really great reminder for people who are also hoping and persevering in their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those stories, Elizabeth C. or Elizabeth Conde. Uh, when, when our students are experiencing difficult situations or challenges, um, and they're having maybe difficult emotions, they're feeling discouraged, or they want to give up. <laughs> As leaders, like, of course, we want to help them, right? We want to care for them. Um, we want to sometimes not healthily, we want to help them fix problems very quickly. And to me, it seems like hope is kind of very tied to perseverance and maybe even a first step towards perseverance. So are there any practical things that we can do to support our students who are going through difficult situations that can lead them towards hope? Absolutely. I'm going to use a key word here for us to keep in mind, and that's relationships. So I'm going to start with relationships with uh, parents or guardians, right? Uh, If I have a program and I'm working with youth, I want to be able to have lines of communication with those persons. The other thing is relationships with what's called the SONPA, the significant other non-parenting adult. And those are coaches, teachers, youth leaders, um, someone that the person connects with, a mentor, Uh, Those relationships are very important. The other is peer support, because it's in that environment that they sort of uh, care for each other. They can do problem solving together. They can talk about what's happening. And then I'm going to say relationships with other resources. Uh, You want to be able to connect them to resources in the community, uh, counseling services, mental health clinics, support groups, hotlines, uh, make sure that they have the right access to those. And then as as you are working with them, you want to ask yourself, how is it that I'm helping to build strong relationships in this group? How is it that I am providing uh, problem-solving skills, helping them to identify obstacles, helping them to break things down into smaller pieces, and to understand mistakes as opportunities for learning and growth. I think that's important. How do we create belonging? And an important piece for the growth of young people is especially helping parents to understand the difference between surveillance and supervision. Surveillance is about distrust. I don't trust you. Supervision is about making decisions with you. Supervision is about growth. Supervision is about account- the accountability that's necessary for that growth to take place, but it's also about independence and moving you toward becoming the person that you really are. And therefore, it's about listening. And so you have to say, what is it that you want to become? And what are the step-by-step plans that you have for getting there? And what are the things that you need to support making this happen? Yeah, there's something really like special in that, that I think whenever we think about relationships, and sometimes we forget these are relationships with young people, their brain's still developing. <laughs> there are things that they can't do. Mm-hmm. They can't think long term as well as we can. They need to help someone to help them break things down. They need someone to help them uh, think more uh, practically instead of, uh, or they can help them think more abstractly because their brain's not there yet. (laughs) Their Mm -hmm. brain is still developing. So those are great, really great practical ideas that I think really help those relationships that we want to build with young people. Um, Elizabeth Thomas, uh, when we think about supporting our students, sometimes we want to give them uh, hope and perseverance and and here I'm showing a little bit of my bias and maybe a little bit of my pain. <laughs> um, sometimes we might say things that are well-meaning. Uh, we want to be helpful. We want to help them feel better. But sometimes it's kind of like silver silver lining kind of things that the young person can't doesn't know what to do with or 
it invalidates part of what they're feeling. And so for me, the word that comes across is like toxic positivity. So when I think about hope, it's like, how do we give hope? But how do we also not go into the realm of possibly going into toxic positivity? Um, Can you tell us what toxic positivity is and how we can avoid it? Yeah, this is an important question because as a faith community, it can be very tempting to interpret that and to interpret Christianity and our hope in Christ as requiring us to embody uh, traits of uh, Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, right? He's always optimistic, joyful, happy, with a positive outlook and bouncing off his tail. We tell each other Bible verses like, rejoice in the Lord always. Y todas las cosas nos ayudan a bien. Young people, especially teenagers in very early 20s, they're still developing their identity, their critical think abilities, and their emotional resilience necessary to navigate life's challenges. It is our responsibility as adults to teach them healthy coping skills to handle life's ups and downs. So just brushing it off, downplaying or dismissing a young person's feelings, their struggles or their problems can be deeply hurtful and harmful. Uh, when we promote the belief that we should always maintain a positive mindset and suppress any negative emotions or experiences, it really undermines their sense of self-worth and makes them feel that their thoughts and feelings don't matter. And this approach also creates distrust because they may perceive adults as not being honest and transparent, that we're not being real. And in essence, this is toxic positivity. Leaders and parents, we really need to practice honesty and model what it means to grapple with pain, with crisis, confusion, and despair. They need us to teach them how scripture leads us towards both psychological and spiritual hope. Hope that really flows from a growing faith. And um, in book three of the Junto series, we discuss the practice of modeling. And Marcos emphasizes the importance of using the Psalms of Lament as a means of modeling how to speak to God with complete honesty and transparency. So if we can do that for our youth, we're teaching them a big lesson. Um, You mentioned Juntos a couple of times, and you all developed this actually through a sub-grant with um, Fuller Youth Institute, uh, the sub-grant of uh, character and virtue development and you're actually launching juntos later this year so can you tell us a little bit about it yes so uh juntos is the bilingual english and spanish six book series that ng3 is producing and so juntos provides stories and research insights and cultural analysis and practical theology and reflection questions to explore new ideas and implement changing practices within congregations And so the series emphasizes integrating ministry and leadership practices that nurture these intergenerational relationships that we've been talking about and really support youth's faith. Great. Um, I'm really, uh, it's so thoughtful that you think about it in in an intergenerational way. And Marcos, I wonder if you can talk to us uh, about how Juntos promotes Um, intergenerational connections in the church. And from your experience as a pastor, why is it important for leaders to invest in learning and in practicing and in reflecting at the same time that they're nurturing their students' character development? The main purpose as we looked at uh, creating this this, um, series of books was that there's a lot of curriculum out there on how to uh, teach young people how to disciple young people, how to fill in the blank. Uh, but it's always a one-way street. It's always what do we do with them, right, as objects. <laughs> but we actually took a different approach and said, well, leaders repeat the models that they've received in their own formation. So why don't we create a a resource for people for leaders? We wanted to create a curriculum that could help people uh, reflect on their own journey with Christ, their own discipleship journey, and the ways in which they were discipled and they were they were formed, so that a they could retener lo bueno, right? <laughs> Keep all that is good from those models, but also begin to wonder why, 
why of some of those models and what it is that is being that was transmit, transmitted, what was healthy, what was not. So I think it's important for, for pastoral leaders, um, right? If we move this, our intent is not just to keep it within the youth ministry department, within the children's department. This is an all church, all congregation involvement um, so that even anybody that's involved in congregational life could use this resource for self-awareness on how they are communicating Christ-likeness and so that they also reflect back on some of their experiences, right? You learn from the reflection of experiences, not from the experiences themselves, right? So uh, so those thinking together spaces are, are moments for, for leaders, for pastors to continue to learn because that's one of the, the, the highest levels of leadership is a learning leader, right? Um, it's not one that just continues to do the same or tries to fix everything. And that means letting go of a lot of control and trusting the spirit and really cultivate that in us. It's uncharted territory. It could be scary, but it actually helps to clarify what is my role and what is not my role. And you leave a lot more room for the spirit to work. Yeah, there, there's so much there that leaders, you know, about leadership um, that we learn from young people and we need to listen. And, and I'm also wondering about this bilingual aspect because in intergenerational spaces and not just in the Latina church and other immigrant spaces as well, there is an, an added layer of bilingual aspects to to the ministry so elizabeth elizabeth conde uh can you tell us a little bit about like the realities of intergenerational ministry are there any challenges do you have any tips or any what's life giving about these spaces for youth and for leaders as well the listening pieces are definitely the life-giving pieces right because it allows everybody to learn and it puts everybody on the same plane the challenge uh, when it comes to the linguistic piece, they're, they're very much there, but the desire to create relationship helps us to get past the challenge. If we're gonna talk about listening, if we're gonna talk about learning, et cetera, et cetera, you have to deal with the issue of power and authority in the relationship. In countries of origin, it's very natural for the um, senior generations to feel that they have the power and they have the authority and that that is a top-down relationship. When we come here, those relationships and the sense of power in those relationships changes. We're not living in dictatorships. We're not living in, you know, this, this hierarchy. We're living in places where uh, young people are asked to make choices very early on. Do you want to wear a red pair of shorts? Do you want to wear, you know, a pink pair of shorts, right? Very early on, you have choices that you make. And that's confusing when you have to make choices at school and you can't make choices at home. Mm -hmm. And so right away, when the, the pastoral person has to be the one to figure this out, together they look at materials, together they do readings, and Together, they have had to figure out a lot of things about each other, right? You have to be all in. They're all in. They're appreciating each other. They're and they're trusting each other. Bueno, tú eres que me vas a enseñar a mí. Vamos a ver lo que tú vas a hacer, right? Yo estoy confiando en ti, muchacho, right? Yo estoy en tus manos. That's very, you know, those kinds of sayings. That begins to show me, ah, there's trust. There's appreciation for the young person. There's respect for the young person. There is trust here. In this series of books that, we're, that we're, we've worked on very uh, hard, those exercises are going to be there. And it's, it's a way of guiding this kind of um, healing in relationship and, and forming the strength in the relationships that Marcos was speaking about. That's so beautiful. And I think that word that you mentioned, healing, is so important, especially in intergenerational churches. There's intergenerational intergenerational trauma, but also just like that trust and 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 having those relationships where there's trust and there's respect is also so hope giving. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that. And yeah, definitely check out our show notes page for more information about Juntos uh, as a resource. And now we have a very fun part, more fun aspect of this episode, and it is our lightning round. And so these questions are inspired by questions that we asked youth leaders, and they are entirely subjective, one word, one sentence no context and so i know you all have divvied this uh these questions up so we're gonna get answers from all of you so here we go we're gonna start when you were a teenager who taught you most about love uh mi abuelita and my mom and, and la iglesia de el alto in costa rica Awesome. Okay. What is the greatest lesson you've learned about forgiveness? Release. Mm. Mm. Yes. In this season of your life, compassion looks like? Oh, that's my superpowers. Like my ability to make people laugh and brighten their day and remind them that other people's negative experiences are not their own. Mm, I love that. Okay. Uh, what or who gives you hope? Um, Millennial-led churches. Yes, millennials. Okay, I'm a millennial. That's why I'm so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no bashing other generations. I love you all. Just I'm taking pride in that. Thanks, Marcos, for that recognition. I, I should specify Latinx millennial. Like churches, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, I needed to be more specific. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. Um, on a scale of one to ten, with one being low and ten being high, <laughs> how much um humility do you have? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me take this one. And so let me put it this way. I am five foot one with a six foot two attitude. <laughs> So on a scale of one to 10, I'm about, I would say on 11. It's spoken like a true researcher. <laughs> okay, um, last question. When something is hard, what is a practice that helps you persevere? Ride the wave. Because there are always moments in which you can't believe in yourself you can't see it you can't you can't you're not gonna make it no no ride the wave because then comes insight ride the wave and i would add ride the wave with someone else don't do it alone so juntos ride the wave juntos (laughs) oh wow thank you so much um it was it has been such a pleasure And this season, we're asking our guests to help us wrap each episode with a blessing. So in light of our conversation, Elizabeth Conde, can you give us a benediction? May the Lord bless our relationships that they may become healthy. May the Lord enlarge the range of emotions through the scriptures. May the Lord enter our reflections to give us wisdom and discernment. May the Lord guide us into teaching and learning that we might listen with God's heart and compassion. May the Lord bring healing, hope, and resilience for our communities through our work and our different gifts. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. This podcast is one of the many free resources produced by the Fuller Youth Institute. Check out the show notes for links to all the resources mentioned in today's episode. And finally, here is one more thought from a young person. So you experience perseverance when? I've had like a lot of like self-esteem issues in middle school. It was very hard for me to talk to people and be social because I felt like I didn't belong especially when I didn't know a lot of Asian kids or specifically Indonesian kids so I felt like I couldn't really fit in as much but I met people who told me how to like do things and so it's made me like feel like I had to just persevere through all of it. Today I'm 
probably one of the most like social I'm like sort of like a social butterfly my friends call me just like from seventh to ninth grade like I feel like I've persevered through like that whole time period because I can see that I wasn't as very social until now and it was because I had to just persevere through the hardships of thinking that I couldn't really be social or like be liked enough as a kid by my own peers but I just realized I had to just be who I was and just find people who would have liked me for me.